Today, I want to go through a handful of slides from the presentation I did on Monday on the Reasoned Answers channel. That was with Thaddeus and with Sonia Azam. I'm going to go through a handful of the slides. I want to cover those and make sure that people understand what Islam, the doctrine, the ideology, the major scholars, and the Sharia think of the Bible, Christians, Jews, Judaism, and Christianity, what it really thinks. What Muslims are not saying because they're not allowed to reveal this information, it is the secrets of the Muslims. There's a prohibition in the Sharia from having them actually reveal this to you. What you see on the screen, this is the most reliable, the most used, the most sold, the most popular Sharia manual in the world. It's called the Reliance of the Traveler, also known as the Umdat al-Salik. This is its front page, the classic manual of Islamic sacred law. This one is incredibly highly regarded. It is very, very highly certified by the major Islamic institutions in the world. It is very detailed. It's a single volume, incredibly detailed, and for that reason it's become the most popular Sharia manual in the world. We will refer to this extensively now and in the future, and we will also use numerous other Sharia manuals and fiqh manuals from the major, most trusted Islamic scholars. When I'm done here, please go look at the entire show. I will link to it. Have a look at it. I discuss much of this in detail. I felt that this was relevant to bring to people so you understand where these Islamic apologists are coming from, where people like Ahmad Didat and Zakir Naik are coming from when they speak about the Bible, when they speak about Christians and Jews, what they really think but they don't reveal. In the appendix, which is not in every single copy of the Reliance, and I will link to two copies. One, a neatly reformatted version with an index, searchable, and this one also searchable, but as you can see, not very well scanned. But this one has the appendix W, which is not common to every single copy, and there's good reason for that. So, section W 4.0, the finality of the prophet's message. And it says here, this section has been translated to clarify possible confusions among Muslims as to Islam's place among world religions. Paragraph 2. Previously revealed religions were valid in their own eras, as attested to by many verses of the Qur'an, but were abrogated by the universal message of Islam, as is attested to by many verses of the Qur'an. English-speaking Muslims are occasionally exposed to erroneous theories affirming these religions' validity, but denying or not mentioning their abrogation, or that it is unbelief, kufr, to hold that the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions such as Christianity or Judaism are acceptable to Allah after he sent Muhammad. This is a matter over which there is no disagreement among Islamic scholars. Islam is the final religion. According to the Sharia, the ultimate sacred law of Islam, the Sharia is the final, it is the bedrock, the substrate of Islam. This is the final definition. And according to this, Judaism and Christianity have been abrogated. That they are remnant cults, stubborn cults, that now bear the names of formerly valid religions called Christianity and Judaism that are not acceptable to Allah, not acceptable. And there's no disagreement among the Islamic scholars. I've read through various of the scholarly manuals and they all agree. We will also learn that Islam has defined what Muslims need to think. It's called the Ijma, the consensus. And they're not allowed to deviate. They're not allowed to utilize reason. Reason is called deviance. They merely have to submit to the consensus. Any of their reason is used to simply to justify why this is so. They merely have to justify what the consensus is. It is rationalization. It is not free thought. There is no free thought under the Sharia. We'll get to that. Let us look at Ibn Kathir, who is one of the major tafsir scholars and one of the most respected scholars in Islam, on Quran 9, 30 and 31. Fighting the Jews and Christians is legislated. This is Sharia. This is legally legislated because the Jews and Christians are idolaters and disbelievers. Allah encourages the believers to fight the polytheists, the disbelieving Jews and Christians, who uttered this terrible statement and utter lies against Allah. As for the Jews, they claim that Uzair was the son of Allah. I'd love to see where that is referenced. Please leave a comment. Where, where does that come from? Allah is free of what they attribute to him. As for the misguidance of Christians over Jesus, this is the Gnostic 
Islamic Jesus taken from Gnostic texts. It is obvious this is why Allah declared both groups to be liars. They have no proof that supports their claim other than lies and fabrications. They imitate the previous nations who fell into misguidance just as Jews and Christians did. May Allah fight them. Ibn Abbas said, may Allah curse them. How they are deluded away from the truth. How they deviate from truth when it is apparent. This is the official Islamic position on Judaism and Christianity, on Jews and Christians. Let us go back to the reliance of the traveler, the world's most popular Sharia manual. It is fairly obvious that Muhammad being sent to all mankind would be pointless if all other religions were not now abrogated, as would jihad. So jihad would be pointless if all other religions had not now been abrogated, something that Ibn al-Arabi discusses in what is unmistakably a treatment of its outward military aspect and rules. Ah, so Ibn al-Arabi discusses the military aspect and rules of jihad. And if you read through the Sharia manual, I will give you the links to read up the Shari definition, the full legal, the only valid definition of jihad in Islam and in the Sharia. You will not like what you read. And they speak of believer against unbeliever, sword against sword, which Hurab points out would be meaningless if both sides were upon guidance. So only Islam is upon guidance. While disobedient Muslims will one day leave the hellfire, the Jews and the Christians, the people of the book, the Al Al Khitab, who did not accept Muhammad, will remain in hell forever, which is as far from the universal validity of all religions as anything could be. They don't see us as Abrahamic religions. That is Taqiyya. They do not, this whole bridge building and all of this um, interfaith dialogue, no, this is the formal official Sharia definition, what they think of your religion. Let's look at Ibn Abbas. Fight against such of those who have been given the scripture, the Jews and the Christians, who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor in the bliss of paradise. And they forbid not in the Torah that which Allah hath forbidden by his messenger, and they follow not the religion of truth. That's the deen ul-haq, the deen of truth. Islam, we are the deans of falsehood. And they do not submit themselves to Allah through confession of Allah's divine oneness, the Tawhid. The Trinity is blasphemy in Islam. It's the major crime. It's shirk against Allah. We associate partners with Allah. So until they pay the tribute, until they pay tribute, we owe the Muslims tribute for this sin, for this blasphemy, for this crime in Sharia. And we must be brought low, abased. Let's continue this. So, Judaism and Christianity are deen al-batil because Islam is the deen al-haq, the religion of truth. We are the false religion of Satan. I must make note here. Deen means much more than religion. Much, much more. Please watch the show. I discuss it. There are four elements to it. It is, it is not many. Islam is not a religion. Even Islam says it's not a religion. So, let's look at Quran 242. Do not mix up truth with falsehood and knowingly hide the truth. And this scholar, this is the major scholarly work in Islam and it says the following do not mix up Judaism and Christianity with Islam so a thing is mixed up when it is mixed with something similar to it then it is not clear so now the word used for falsehood here is batel which means when something becomes unsound and worthless it can also mean in vain the false al batel is one of the names of Satan so in other words Judaism and Christianity must not be confused with Islam. We are falsehood, battle. We are worshipping in vain. We are practicing in vain. Our religions are unsound. We, they are worthless. And battle is one of the names of Satan. We are followers of Satan. Allah is makr. Allah is a makr, a deceiver. In fact, according to the Quran, Allah is the greatest of deceivers. Now, sometimes many of those verses will be, will be translated as scheme or plan, Allah planned. No, that is also deceit. That is, in fact, taqiyya. Allah is the greatest of deceivers. He is a makr. Let us continue. Let us look at Ibn Kathir on Christians having to serve Muhammad. And this is the official position, the scholarly position on the Jews. 
Allah forbade the Jews from distorting the truth with falsehood and from hiding the truth and spreading falsehood. Allah ordered the Jews to make the truth known. And do not mix Judaism and Christianity with Islam while you know the truth that the religion of Allah is Islam and that Judaism and Christianity are innovations that did not come from Allah. So the Jews hid the truth that Islam was the religion we ought to follow. They edited the Bible according to them. And the word innovations is a legal term from the Sharia, meaning bidda. And I discussed that in the first episode I did with uh, the Reason Dancers channel. Bidda is when you invent things in Islam that do not follow the consensus and do not follow the Sharia. So these are crimes. Blasphemy, effectively. So now, they say, Do not hide the knowledge that you have of my messenger, Muhammad, and what he was sent with. His description, which you know about, can be found written in the books that you have. The Sharia insists, and Muslims cannot argue with the Sharia, it insists that Muhammad is in the Bible. They cannot argue with this. It is not possible for them to do so. And he says, Muqatil said, Allah's statement to the people of the book, the Jews and Christians, is perform the prayer behind the Prophet. This is what the Sharia says we must do, and the Sharia must be imposed on the entire world. This is their belief. Now, the definition of good and bad and the use of reason in Islam. We get told, well, you know, Islam is about reason and intellect. No, that is absolutely not true. Good and bad is what the Sharia says. Good and bad is what Muhammad did. Good and bad is what Muhammad allowed or didn't allow. Told them to do or said not to do. That is how good and bad is defined. If Muhammad slept with a nine-year-old, which he did, that is good. If Muhammad stoned people to death, that is good. You are not to debate that. You're not to argue that. So it cannot be said that an act which the mind deems good is therefore good in the eyes of Allah. Its performance called for and its doer rewarded by Allah. Or that whatever the mind feels to be bad is thus bad in the eyes of Allah. Its non-performance called for and its doer punished by Allah. So if your mind, your thought, your, your moral sense, your sense of natural law, your inner voice, your conscience says that this is good, but the Sharia and the Ijma overrule you, then, then you are wrong. You have to submit. You have to deny your senses. You have to deny whatever it is that you think is truth and is correct. You simply have to submit. Let's look at the meaning of good and bad. This is in the Sharia, Reliance of the Traveler. Here's a little, this is the original in the other version with the Arabic. So, the basic premise of this school of thought is that the good is what the lawgiver, synonymous with Allah or Muhammad, has indicated is good by permitting it or asking it to be done. And the bad is what the lawgiver has indicated is bad by asking it not to be done. The good is not what reason considers good, nor is the bad what reason considers bad. The good and bad, according to this school of thought, is the sacred law, not reason. If their concept of good and bad conflicts with Sharia, then, then they are wrong. They merely have to submit. So their use of the intellect is to justify, it is to rationalize, it is to protect whatever Sharia says. Let's look at a case of a deviant sect who made reason the ultimate criterion of truth. Well, they were killed. So, it is deviation to make reason the ultimate criterion of truth. And also, of course, going back to the first show I did, which discussed the apostate apologists who deny the hadith, well, it says here, these are known to reject hadith despite the fact that the Quran cannot be completely understood without referring to hadith and sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. That's in the water cup of Imam al-Haramain al-Juwaini, the classical manual of the Sul al-Fiqh, which is Islamic sacred law. Let's have another look, go back to the Sharia manual, the Umdat al-Salik, Reliance of the Traveler. This is what happens under Sharia law to Jews and Christians who become dhimmis under Sharia law, and they're discussing the use of funds. When the proceeds are directed to an unlawful use, such as building a church or purchasing lamps for a church, this assists disobedience to Allah. The same is true of an endowment for printing the Torah of the New Testament, which is invalid because the Jews and Christians have altered the texts, and they've interpolated spurious material, edited the text and added lies, in other words. It not being permissible to occupy oneself with printing their scriptures. 
because doing so is to participate in their disobedience to Allah. This is the Sharia. This is the final word of Islam. This is the final authority. There is nothing above this. The indemnity for the death or injury of a woman is one half the indemnity paid for a man. This is further from the Sharia. So the woman's value is half that of a man. This is Sharia law. The indemnity paid for a Jew or a Christian is one third of the indemnity paid for a Muslim. And the indemnity paid for a Zoroastrian is one fifteenth. I'm going to show you one more thing. This is again from the Umdat al-Salik, the Reliance of the Traveler. P75.3, contending with what the Prophet has brought. The Prophet said, None of you believes until his inclinations conform to what I have brought. Now, Imam Nawawi, one of the major Sharia scholars, I have his book, says, This means a person must examine his acts in light of the Quran and Sunnah, suspending his own inclinations and following what the Prophet has brought. The hadith resembles the word of Allah. When Allah and his messenger have decided the matter, no believer, male or female, has a choice in their affair. Quran 33, 36. You have to obey. There is no disagreement. That is submission. That is what Islam means. Submission. And this is what they mean. You do not follow your own way. You will submit to the Sharia. Thanks. Please watch the video. I'll have the links and I'll have something pop up with a link to the video. Go and see more. Please understand what Muslims really think of you and your beliefs. Thank you.